this morning. Uh, of course, I want to start with a word of prayer first thing before we do anything today. Uh, Lord God, we just come before you, Father. And like your word says in Ephesians six eighteen, that you want us to keep on praying, Lord, for all things. So, Lord, this morning I'd like to lift up those, Lord, that are in the path of the fires that are raging here in California. Lord, not only those here in Southern California, but Northern as well. And Lord God, I don't know what sign it is that you're teaching us with these things. But Lord, I do know that there are those that are in danger. And Lord, I know that you are the God that can save them. So Lord, I just lift them up to you. I lift the firefighters up to you, Lord. I lift the equipment that they're using up to you, Father. And I just ask that you would make favorable things happen on those fire lines. And Lord God, we thank you again for your beauty, for this world, for the things that you have made, Lord God. And we pray to you today because we know that you hear us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to worship his name this morning, so stand up wherever you are. Whether you're at home, okay, don't stand up in your car. All right, worship him. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever, for He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Good morning. Good morning, Generations Online. I'm not sure I'm on. So I will just stand here and look pretty. I'm green. Oh. 
Thank you. Thank you. Now I hear me. All right. I am continuing in the Passions Translation, the final part of Psalms 107. You recall last week they cried out, Lord, help us, rescue us, and he did. And so it continues in verse 23. Some of us set sail from the sea to faraway ports, transporting our goods from ship to shore. Remember, this is the, those that were exiled are coming back. We were witnessing, we were witnesses of God's power out in the ocean deep. We saw breathtaking wonders upon the high seas. When God spoke, he stirred the storm. Lifting high the waves with hurricane winds, ships were tossed by swelling sea, rising to the sky, then dropping down to the depths, reeling like drunkards, spinning like tops, everyone at their wit's end. I think we all can understand that statement. Everyone at their wit's end, until even sailors despaired of life, cringing in terror. Then we cried out, Lord, help us, rescue us, and he did. God stilled the storm, calmed the waves, and he hushed the hurricane winds to only a whisper. We were so relieved, so glad as he guided us safely to harbor in a quiet haven. So lift your hands and give thanks to God for his marvelous kindness and for his miracles of mercy for those he loves. Let's exalt him on high and lift our praises in public. Let all the people and the leaders of the nation know how great and wonderful is Yahweh our God. Whenever he chooses, he can dry up a river and turn the land into a desert. Or he can take a fruitful land and make it into a salt water swamp, all because of the wickedness of those who dwell there. But he also can turn a barren wilderness into an oasis with water. He can make springs flow into desert lands and turn them into fertile valleys so that cities spring up. And he gives it all to those who are hungry. They can plant their fields and vineyards there and reap a bumper crop and gather a fruitful harvest. God will bless them and cause them to multiply and prosper. But others will become poor, humbled because of their oppression, tyranny, and sorrows. For God pours contempt upon their arrogant abuse of power heaping scorn upon their princes and makes them wander among ruins. But he raises up the poor and lowly with his favor, giving them a safe place to live where no one can touch them. God will grant them a large family and bless them. The lovers of God will rejoice when they see this. Good men are glad when the evil ones are silenced. If you are truly wise, you'll learn from what I've told you. It's time for you to consider these profound lessons of God's great love and mercy. And always remember that when we cry out, he hears us. Thank you. The word of God never gets tired of hearing the word of God. We never get tired of God speaking into our lives dropping a nugget that will help us become the person that he's always designed us to be. And so that's why I appreciate so much uh, God's word and, and how it is delivered. I, I appreciate the fact that uh, everyone in the room stops what they're doing and looks at the reader so that they can hear what the word of God is saying to their lives. People really do want to know salvation they want to know healing they want to know the power of god and the way we do that is by hearing his word and allowing his word to transform who we are so we have a great testimony today god's word 
has touched our lives and prepared us for what God has in store in this worship and in this teaching moment we're going to have over the next 60 minutes. So we give you praise. We give you thanks. We adore your name, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to worship him some more this morning. Lord, your forgiveness is my whole life. like holy water on our skin. Lord, there is nobody that loves us like you do, Father. Nobody that cares for us like you do, Lord. Every morning, if I could be. 
Jesús en Jesucristo
never will forget. Oh, you moved the mountains, Lord. Oh, you moved the mountains for generations, church, Father God. I've seen you move, Lord. Lord, you make a way for us, Father God. In the middle of a pandemic, Lord God, you still make a way, Father. Oh, your promise still stands, Lord. You'll never leave us. You'll never leave us, Lord. stand, Lord, in the midst of detractors, those with false words, Lord, that even as we fall ill, Lord, as we lose jobs, truth is your promise it still stands Lord that you will be there and that you'll do it again and again and again Lord we just pray that you continue to to move mountains Lord God Lord we give it up to you Lord, all those things that are what seem to be upside down in our lives, what seem to be backward in our relationships, Lord, what seem to be falling apart, Lord, we give them to you. We ask you to do it again. love you today with all of our hearts because Lord you never hold anything back on us Lord Lord you love us with your all and we thank you today it's in your name that we pray amen Hallelujah. All right, so I'm going to give you a few announcements. And we have some exciting things coming up over the next couple weeks, so I want you to listen closely because I have some important announcements for you today. I know you kind of tune us out at this point and go and get coffee or take a bathroom break, which I understand, but I need you to listen today. So even if you miss it, make sure you rewind a little bit later and listen to these announcements. Of course, first we want you to fill out your your welcome card online. You can do that by going to visitchurch.net. We say that all the time, but I'm going to remind you again. Of course, that brings you to our website where you can do all kinds of things, including filling out prayer requests, uh, tithing, um, all kinds of different things are on there. You can even see our live feed on there. If you're on Facebook right now and you'd rather do it through there, you can do that as well. Of course, make sure that also today that as you're giving your tithes and offerings that you go to visitchurch.net. Uh, you could also go to paypal.me slash generations church, uh, generations church uh, and it'll take you directly to our PayPal giving account as well. You can do it that way. And, of course, you can also mail your tithes and offerings into the church here at 6245 Palm Avenue, San Bernardino, California, and that amazing zip code of 92407. All right, here's the first amazing announcement I have for you. And if we had, like, a million people in here, or actually if we even had 20 in here, they would scream and yell and clap, and it is, we are going to be having a movie night in our parking lot next Saturday. So this Saturday coming up, not the Saturday after, but this next Saturday is a movie in our parking lot. We are going to be showing the movie Trolls World Tour, 
Uh, we're going to do that in our parking lot. There's going to be areas spaced out for families to be together. We're also going to have a few drive-up spaces for those of you who do not want to get out of your car and you want to drive up and pretend you're at the drive-in movie. We're going to have that as well. So make sure you come for that. I think the movie's probably going to start about 7.30. It all kind of depends as the sun goes down. Mason and I were out there this last week testing the sunset and stuff. But So we're going to say about 7.30, but you can, of course, get here earlier so you can get those primo spots for the movie. So make sure that you come on Saturday night. Of course, space will be limited. We will have enough space so that we can do social distancing. Once those spaces are filled, you may have to stand all the way out in the back and not see very well. So make sure you get there early. Oh, here's the best part. It costs zero dollars. Nothing for you to come, nothing for you to see the movie. Just come and hang out with us on this Saturday night. Then on Saturday, 9, 12, at 9 a.m., we are going to start a new thing where it's called uh, Coffee with Your Pastors. This Saturday is the So, I mean, oh, sorry, is it the one after that? Yes. Ah, is that the 19th then? Yes. Boy. This Saturday is the 12th. Mason, this Saturday is the 12th. 9, 19 then, Coffee with Your Pastors at 9 a.m. in the parking lot. You bring your own coffee, your own Danish. Uh, we will social distance. I'll uh, be time to hang out with your pastors, ask questions, and just fellowship. Also, we're going to pray. We're going to pray not only for Generations Church, but for our community at the same time. So make sure you come and hang out with us for that. That's at 9 a.m. on 919. Uh, we'd love to have you here. Also, missions update. Of course, Bruce wants to remind us that God has numerous times at Generations Church done exceedingly and abundantly above all. Uh, right now, we are at $11,050 in mission support contributions. Uh, remember, we have just a few months left in 2020. There are 46 countries where we have missionaries around the world. We want to continue to support them. Uh, I want you to continue to give to that. So make sure you do that at visitchurch.net. Find the giving link and make sure you give to missions as well as your regular weekly tithes and offerings. We can't wait to see what God has in store for us next year as we meet this goal and surpass it. Uh, our Bible studies are active on Zoom meetings, although two of them are on hiatus. Uh, Renew is on hiatus until mid-September. There's no date, it just says mid-September. And I know that's approaching because this is like the end of the first week of September. Uh, Impact ministry is on hiatus until October. In God's Word is on Fridays at 7 p.m. Uh, of course, men's group is on Monday nights. Uh, if, I believe that's at 6.30 p.m. If you're interested in joining a G group, a my crew, or, or actually starting your own, email Keith at GenerationsChurchSB.com. And Keith can help you get set up with that so that we can get your group into this, uh, uh, this loop as well. Or you can uh, email info at GenerationsChurchSB.com. Of course, if you know anybody who needs prayer, they, uh, they can either send us an email at prayer at GenerationsChurchSB.com. Or why don't you do it for them? Some people don't like to ask for prayer. But I know that we all know somebody who needs it. So why don't you send us a prayer request for somebody? Do that either on your welcome card or prayer at GenerationsChurchSB.com. Of course, if you need help, you can do get help at Generations Church. If you need info, you can go info at GenerationsChurchSB.com. Boy, that wears me out. And of course, you can join us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. We have all those channels as well. So there's no excuse for you not being up to date and keeping in contact with us because we have every way that you can do that. And of course, you can also call here at the church, 909-882-7813 as well. Whew. Okay, now I need a break. I give you Pastor Jim Hall. Thank you. What a delight to be here with you. Good to see you. Good to have a, a, an expectant look on your face that God is going to say something today that's going to empower you and prepare you to be a more devoted follower, uh, to reach more people for the kingdom of God, and to lead others to training moments so that they can constantly be in a growth mode. We're, we've been... Uh, for the last uh, six or seven weeks, we've been doing uh, a series out of God's uh, uh, great and precious promises. I don't know if you got the note sheet or not, but 
we have a subtitle, Warning Sign, Wrong Track, Divert, or Crash and Burn. So that's the, the magnitude of the message today. Uh, and, and I want to begin, actually, by uh, asking you to respond to about four questions. Here, here's the, uh, the first question. How many of you know when you are going to take the wrong road? I mean, you know, you're doing something and you decide to, well, I'm going to go do this. I know I shouldn't, but I am going to do this. My, my suspicion is, is we're all guilty of that. We've done that. Here's question number two. How many of you have run the, the red light of life and did the wrong thing knowing it was wrong? Anyone in that category? I've, I've done that too many times. Uh, here's question number three. How many of you have looked at someone and perceived that you are a better person than they are? They've been there? I, I think we're there. And then here's the last question. How many of you wish you could go back in time and redo the mistakes you made? Yeah. Wouldn't that be a great day? I, I just uh, jotted down a couple of notes uh, there that uh, would, would affect me if I could go back uh, to, the, to, to as early as when I gave my life to Christ and what uh, all of that was. I, I, here's what I would have recaptured had I done better decision making. I, I would have about 300,000 more dollars in my pocket than that I have. Uh, because I've, I've made a number of impulsive decisions that uh, cost Sally Hall a lot of money. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think that had I not made those mistakes, I would have nine or ten uh, real estate houses as income streams. That was a goal that I had way back then. And I got, I got too busy spending money than I did in saving money and it, it has set me back. I, would, uh, I think I would have five or six classic cars. Not that I'm especially fond of uh, classic cars. I think they look pretty good. But I, I've had several that I wish I would have kept. I could have kept them, but I didn't keep them. And, well, of course, wouldn't have any place to park them anyway, but so I, I don't know. And then my last uh, statement that I, I realized is I wish I would have started saving money for retirement sooner than I did. So let me just say, if, if you answered yes to those last two questions especially, uh, talk to somebody. Go to uh, someone who knows how to uh, sell stock for you or or help you make uh, financial decisions where you can get your money working for you, and the longer you can have it working for you, the better off you're going to be. So I want to encourage you to consider that, because uh, I don't know how it is with you, but I, I know that I have made a lot of mistakes in my life, just being impulsive, quick on the draw, uh, and, and I've, ta I've had to take a step back and try to uh, get going again. Today, I want us to spend some time uh, looking at the upside of humility, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you how that ties in, in in just a moment, how you can see the upside of humility and the downside of thinking more about yourself than you should. The Bible, in fact, and maybe to your surprise, I was surprised, as I prepared this message, I was surprised at how many references God has toward hum humility. And, and uh, in fact, let's take a look at our, our, our promise uh, from God for this week. God's promise in 1 Peter 5, verse 5, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's the, that's the bar that we're going to be shooting at today. Let's look at it again. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He, what he's saying is there's two kinds of people. There's a, the person who is uh, 
proud, and, and there's nothing wrong with being proud, except if you are over prideful about who you are, what you did, and, and it's about you, not about the kingdom of God. And so we have to keep that into perspective. So one of the things that we, we have to deal with is keeping my pride in balance so that I can be a person full of grace when I am humble before the Lord. There's nothing greater for you to do than to humble yourself before the Lord. Well, get saved first, maybe. That would be pretty important. But then humble yourself in the presence of the Lord. There's a story of a man named Bernie. Bernie uh, Madoff, when he, when he wasn't flying his private jet across the Atlantic or watching sunset from the deck of one of his yachts, he was slicing a life uh, of luxury inside his 10,000 square foot Lexington Avenue penthouse in New York City. Do you get the sense that the dude had bucks? He, he, he had some money. His yacht cost $7 million. His jet cost $24 million. He had a home in France, a beach home in Montac. He, he had a, a house in Palm Beach. He had cars and boats and houses. And it, his wife had furs and designer ha handbags, uh, ex expensive china and real silver and gold utensils. It, it was just uh, uh, apparently the, that 10,000 square foot place in New York just must have been a place to die for in, in terms of how they decorated it. It, it. Because when it came to decor, he turned that uh, over to his wife and let her make those decisions. And, and uh, she spared no expense. Gold scones lined the wallpaper. Central Asian uh, rugs covered the floors. Greek and Egyptian statues for, were ap approved by the guests. It, it was just a delight. Everyone wanted to go to his house. Everyone wanted to be there, and everyone wanted to know him. In fact, people stood in line just to shake his hand. One of the people who esteemed him very high was Steven Spielberg. He, he thought the guy walked water. And to stand in his Manhattan office was to stand in the epicenter of investment success, or so it seemed, or so it seemed. Until the morning of December the 10th, 2008, that's when the charade ended. That's when Bernie Madoff, his, this generation's infamous scam artist, sat down with his wife and his two sons and confess that it was nothing more than a giant Ponzi scheme. Just one big lie. How many of you ever been caught up by a Ponzi scheme where someone's talked is so good, how could it not happen? And you do it, and of course you lose your money rather quickly. I've had one of those happen to me. Fortunately, it was just uh, like a $1,000, and so it didn't, uh, it, you know, pound me into the sand, but it, it nevertheless, to know that he got cheated uh, was, was a, a harsh thing so that people started rallying against him. And so over the next days, weeks, and months, the staggering details be, be, became public knowledge. Madoff had masterminded a 20-year-long shell game, the biggest financial crime in United States history, and he had, he had swindled people out of billions of dollars. So rich and famous people can be as money hungry as the guy that has $10 in his pocket and wonders where he's going to sleep tonight. 
people have those tensions and even these wealthy people have felt uh, uh, they, they wanted more. And here was the guy who was going to give them more. They just kept giving him money after money after money after he kept talking about what his next investment is going to be and all of those sorts of things. His collapse was of biblical proportions. In short order, he was stripped of everything. No money, no future, no family. One of his sons committed suicide. His wife went into seclusion. And 71-year-old Bernie Madoff was sentenced to spend the rest of his life as a prison number 617-27-054. That's what he's known for. That's what got him uh, in tr trouble. Because you have to ask the question, why did he do that? Some people just, it's a sport with them, I'm sure. But with, with uh, Barney, it must have been something different. And, and many people, one biographer said it was his quest for status. It was his desire to be the center of attention of the smart people, the financial giants of the world. And the reason apparently was because when he was a young kid, he was rejected. They, they didn't want to play with his ball. They went and played with other people. Uh, he, he couldn't keep a girlfriend. They would jilt him one after another. And, and it just was a devastating uh, experience. And somewhere along the line, he must have made a decision to himself. One of these days, I'm going to have all the money a person could ever want. And he set himself to do that by putting together that 20-year-old Ponzi scheme. One of the things we know about him is we know that he knew how to make money. And when it came, and with it came the stature that had eluded him. Medcalf was addicted to adoration. He was hooked on recognition. He wanted the applause of people, and money was his way of earning it. So he elbowed his way up to the top of the mountain, to the peak of his career, only to discover that there's very little space up there, and only to discover that it's very slippery. It's easy to fall out of grace at any given moment. And, and so he was a driven by the applause of people. If he would have channeled, here, here's, that's the interesting thing to me, if he would have channeled his expertise into making other people wealthy, himself included, then everyone could have been better off. But he would still be considered the king on Wall Street. That was what he wanted. And I've often said this, if a bad guy gave as much time and talent to helping other people make money as he does for himself, it would be a win for everybody. So why doesn't a guy like that, that has that skill and that ability to uh, choose excellent uh, uh, sources to, to invest in and how come he doesn't say, this is so good, I'm going to tell Steven Spielberg about it. This, this feels so good, I'm going to tell Magic Johnson about it. Whoever, whatever, all those people who crowded around him all the time. And, and it would have been a win if he would have done that. And I'm not talking about someone doing a, a, a robbery of you on the corner of walk and don't walk. I, I, I'm talking about a con artist. See, anyone who, like Madoff, could learn to turn his efforts into a money-making machine. He would have had all the money he could ever want, and people around him would have that same sensation. But there's a condition that goes with that. If we were to convince someone to do it that way, this person would have to have a desire to help others get ahead in life. If he has no care for people, he's going to keep all the money for himself. 
and he's going to taunt it, and he's going to use his money against people that try to intercept his goal in life. And here's the problem. Will you or I give most of our attention to ourselves, and will we make a place for others to get blessed as well? If we were the one controlling the money, if we had the insight and the stock market and the wherewithal to walk with the right crowd and to make those decisions, we have to examine ourselves. Would we do it for ourselves or would we bring people with us? I would trust or I would hope, I would expect that we could bring people with us and teach them what we know so they can experience what we've we've experience because the idea is this people are going to take one side or the other of that debate you should take people with you don't take anyone with you that's going to be a, an ongoing debate that people have to deal with so one minute he was the on the cover of time magazine and the next moment he was banished to a life without people is in prison, never to get out again. Which is to say, sooner or later, your pride in yourself will catch up to you. And if you are not humble, you're going to miss out on everything. That's what happened to Barney. He wasn't humble. In fact, this is what drove him and it came to be his ruination also. What I want to do with the rest of this message, I, I want to share with you what God's mindset on humility is and how much God values it. Listen to this one, Numbers 12, 3. If you don't have a, a note sheet, uh, I would encourage you to write this on something so that you can rehearse these later. Numbers 12, verse 3. Check this out. This is God speaking about Moses. Now, if you have God saying these kinds of words to you, it would revolutionize everything about you. Here it is. Now, Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Thus says the Lord. I think that would be incredible that you and I could live our lives so righteous, so complete, with, with integrity and with honor, with, with the intent to bring others with us so that they can experience the blessings of the Lord. God would say to us, Moses, they call us by our name. Jim was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Could I challenge you this morning to live your life in such a way that God will say those very words to you? He wants to. And he begins with this mindset of you being a humble person. Let's look at another one, a familiar verse to, to most of us, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will heal their sins, and will heal their land. Do you want to be blessed of God? How many want to be blessed of God? Let me see your hands. Yes, all across the auditorium. Here's what we have to understand. If we want to be blessed by God, it begins with being a humble person. Not long enough till you get the blessing, but for the rest of your life, that it is said of you, there goes a humble person. So, and to tell you the truth, the reason why people don't want to really be humble is because it, it makes you look like a wimp. But, you know, that, that's in the, in the eyes of society. We don't want our, the eyes of society 
judging who we are. They can make whatever they make, but what we want is we want God to say, JJ, Cynthia, all the rest of us are the most humble people the world's ever seen. See, that's what God is driving the bus for. That's why we have to start making a decision of how are we going to use our, our life. For here's an example of, of the negative side. Isaiah 5, 21, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. That is the pathway to hell. In fact, I, over the last couple of days, I, I have come to the, the conclusion that there is a way that uh, you, you miss out on hell. And that is by, by being super unhumble. That you don't have any regard for anyone else. I think we could walk through the, the scriptures and we could dis discover that there is the possibility that if we are, are one of those persons who is wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight, we'll never hear what God is saying and we'll miss eternal life. This is, this is huge. This is of the magnitude that will shake the world. And, and so we have to think through, what do we want to do? Isaiah 66, verse 2. Has not my hands made all of these things, and so they come into being, declares the Lord? This is the one I esteem. God's saying, hey, check it out, I make everything. I've made everything that's ever been made. I'll be the one who makes anything that's never been made yet. And, and so it's all on God's shoulders. But look what he says. He says, yeah, I make all this stuff. He said, but this is the one that I esteem. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. You want to make points with God, not fake points, but life-changing points, then be one of those persons who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at his word. See, God's word is, is so powerful. We've talked about it time after time that God's word heals us. God's word frees us. God's word enhances us. And we need to give our life to that. We, you see, a lot of people, too many people, want to be known instead of letting God be known. If you let God be known, he'll let you be known. Trust me. But if you don't let God, he's not going to move in your life. In fact, We'll, we'll run across the verse here in just a moment that shows us moving away from God because we don't like that menu. Psalms 18, verse 27. You say humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. He doesn't like that kind of person. He doesn't, he, he, he doesn't say uh, okay, I heard you make a confession at the cross, so we're going to let you in in spite of yourself. It doesn't say that. He, he says that we have to come into heaven not only simply by salvation, but also by being a man or a woman who will release the anointing of Jesus Christ on their lives, that they would do whatever it takes to see someone helped and encouraged and, and their lives change. See, a, a person who is prideful won't, won't bend over and pick up a penny off of the floor. That's, that's way below me. But if I picked up that penny, then I gave it to someone who had a need all of a sudden, I'm a giant in the kingdom of God. 
because I did something good. I didn't let this thing of like, that's too small of a amount. If it's a hundred dollar bill, I'd get down on one knee, but a penny, that doesn't do much for me. So we, we need to, to make certain that we are humble. Humble is not being wrong. Humble actually is being right when people want it to be wrong because they know if you're humble and they're not humble like you're humble, you're going to have to change to be like you, and, and they don't want to do that. And so they choose to stay tied up in lack of humility. Psalms 25.9. Did I already read this one? He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. See, God takes that humble person and says, let me just invest in you. Let, let me give the anointing of my Holy Spirit to you so that you can become the person that God created you to be. Here's Psalms 149, verse 4. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with salvation. Do you want to get it nailed down the right way? Hang around with God. There's nothing wrong with being humble. In fact, it is the place to be. And if you will continue to work on that, it will absolutely change your life. Proverbs 3, 34. Ah, that was not very good. Proverbs 26, 12. Did you see a person wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than there is for that person. Don't think you can outsmart God. A lot of people think they can. A lot of people play on the mercy of God and the grace of God, and that's well. But what we have to do is have God's word transform our lives. Proverbs 16, 5, the Lord detests all the pride of heart. He detests it. He doesn't say, because the person who, who's trying to be uh, uh, humble on their own. They try to look like God. They try to act like God, but they can never get there, of course. And so, so we want to make our decisions based on who God is. Proverbs 18, 13, I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. Those are things to look at. Do, do I, uh, do I uh, like pride and arrogance? Do I like evil behavior? Do I like perverse speech? If I don't like it the way God does, I'm going to be in trouble. God's not going to say, well, uh, I'll, I'll change my opinion for you. He's not going to do that. That's why we have to make decisions. Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, As a prisoner of the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. I wish we had time to break this down for you. Be completely humble and genuine, or gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Let's take a look at one more and we'll pray together. James 4, verse 6. But he gives us more grace. This is why scripture says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. If you it, it, it's not that hard. We make it hard because we're stubborn and we want it on our terms. I, I think I shared with you before, so I'm uh, not very deep into my walk with the Lord, I, I made the discovery that God was really lucky to get a guy like me. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad he didn't come back right after I said that because I'd probably be on the ball field getting dirty and not in heaven rejoicing and having the time of my life. You see, what, what, let me encourage you to do this, that you would... Uh, Get your Bible, get your concordance in your Bible. Every reference there is about humility. Write them down. Read them. Say, Lord, i got to be careful of that one. That's the one that particularly attracts me. So, so I don't want to do that, Lord. 
Let me encourage you to do that. If you are interested in your life growing in Jesus Christ, if you are willing to allow him to start calling the shots in your life, it will be the greatest decision you will ever make. God wants you to be right in the heart of his kingdom, but it requires you to get rid of your lack of humility so that you can be the person that God has designed you to be. Let's pray. Father, we give you all praise, give you all thanks. Lord, our, our thinking has been challenged today because, Lord, there is something to be said about well-being, about doing a job the right way. But there's something else to be said that when we put ourselves above God in one fashion or another, we set ourselves to suffer a huge loss. And so we just come before you today, Lord. And we just ask that you would help each one of us to be quick to acknowledge the faults of our lives. There's nothing wrong with making a mistake. What's wrong with making a mistake is not doing anything to repair the mistake. And so when someone says, well, you did this or that, you don't have to get all huffy about it. In fact, look at me. Here's, here's what I want you to know. You've, if you've been around me very long, you've heard me say this. And, and what I've said is, people can say anything they want to say about you. Doesn't mean it's right. So who cares? If someone makes a statement against you, then you, you ask yourself the question, is that right, Lord? If the Lord says yes, about time someone addressed that in you. Yes, sir, I'm changing that today. I'm not going to live that way any longer. I'm going to change. If what they say has no bearings at all, forgive them and go on. You don't have to get into a battle with people. You just have to love them and help them make the change that they need to make for their lives. That's why we fall in love with Jesus. That's why we commit our lives to him. And that's why he does great things in us and for us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and worship the Lord. We are going to, uh, again, remind you about giving. Go ahead and go to paypal.me slash generationschurch. Uh, visit church.net. Of course, you can mail your tithes and offerings in. And we just want to remind you that there is nobody that loves you like Jesus does. Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus. I stand in all of your amazing ways. I worship you as long as I am breathing. God, you are faithful and true. Nobody loves me. Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus. I stand in all of your amazing ways. I worship you as long as God, we thank you again for this day, for this place, Lord God. Lord, we thank you that you are such an amazing God. And Lord, as the message is telling us today, Lord, help us to find humility, Lord God. Lord, to make that something in our lives, Lord, that people can see. So, Lord God, we want to be humble before you and for you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Elba bump somebody and come to the movie Saturday night.